afternoon, everybody. Please take your seats. We will move right along to the last session. Um, I'm Eugenie Scott. I'm here with my colleagues, Glenn Branch and Josh Rosenow. All three of us are from the National Center for Science Education. If you are not familiar with the National Center for Science Education, I would like to introduce you a bit to our organization. And as they say, a video is worth a thousand words. Well, actually, nobody ever said that, but nonetheless, um, I'm going to try to show a video. The teaching of evolution has produced brush fires of controversy across the country, threatening science teachers, teaching standards, and the future of our children's education. That's where we come in. At the National Center for Science Education, we help those fighting these brush fires to put them out. We're sort of the people who hand out the fire extinguishers. In Dover, for example, we helped to prove that the so-called new science of intelligent design was really creationism. The Dover, Pennsylvania School Board was trying to push an intelligent design textbook into the science classrooms. We knew that the book of Pandas and People was simply creationism in disguise, but the question was how could we prove it? Proof came by comparing two drafts of the very same book. One version said creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator, with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. The second version says intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. Same definition in both, but they replaced the creationist language with intelligent design. The Supreme Court had declared in that same year that teaching creationism in the public schools was unconstitutional. It was clear to us that the reason they made that change was to bypass the court's ruling. The judge was convinced intelligent design is just creationism in disguise and has no place in science classrooms. In Kansas, NCSE would face a different problem. There, the school board voted to delete evolution from the curriculum. We helped the local citizens in Kansas in a number of ways. We helped them with wording for some of the statements that they wanted to make. Uh, we helped them with websites. We helped put them in touch with allies within the state as well as outside of the state. We helped them in every way we could think of so that they would be more likely to have a positive outcome. The next time an election came around, the creationists lost their majority on the board and the real science standards were reinstated. But having the science standards reinstated uh, doesn't mean that the debate is over. From coast to coast, the teaching of evolution has been challenged. In 2003, in Austin, Texas, young Eric Hillis stood up to oppose the insertion of creationism oh, well, in a biology textbook. Um, my name is Eric Hillis, and I'm a sophomore at the LBJ High School Science Academy. I just felt like I had a stake in this. I mean, if we, if we couldn't learn real science because of a board member's personal opinion, then we would be handicapped. I plan to take AP Biology in uh, my upcoming senior or junior year. And I didn't think that science should be based on somebody's religion. If we're going to have good science education now and in the future, we have to support people like Eric, people like the citizens of Dover, people like the citizens in Kansas. We have to put out those brush fires around the country. And NCSE is going to be there until the last fire is out. Well, that's us. Well, I want to first note that we have ample representation of NCSE staff today. Our colleagues David Almond-Smith, uh, Robert Lunn at the table, Steve Newton is also here. Oh, raise your hands, guys. Okay, be sure to say hello to them as well. Now, what my colleagues and I plan to do today is give you a crash course on the creation and evolution controversy and then some uh, uh, ample time, copious time, I hope, for um, discussion. But we also want to bring you up to date with what's going on today in the controversy because... Can you, can you turn your mic back on? Yeah, all right. 
at any rate, my colleagues, Steve Newton, Robert Lunn, uh, David Allman Smith, please say hello to them and thank them also for their very good work at NCSE. So I'm going to start by introducing the topic uh, by talking about the three biggest issues that we have to contend with. Glenn Branch will take over. This is this is a tag team presentation. Uh, Glenn Branch, the deputy director of NCSE, will take over after me and talk about um, where we are today, how we got there. And then uh, Josh Rosenau will talk about how evolution is being linked with climate change in many of the current manifestations of anti-evolutionism. So this will tie in nicely with uh, uh, Peter's talk this morning. We're noticing a lot of similarities between the rhetoric and the, shall we say, the general argument structure of the global uh, warming denialism and anti-evolutionism. But first, uh, let me begin my part of this uh, with what we call the pillars of creationism. Now, we've found that virtually any creationist publication, YouTube video, um, um, newspaper article, op-ed, blog post can be put into one or more of three categories that we call the pillars of creationism. Now, different pillars have been emphasized at different points in the history of this controversy, which really goes back a very long way. Um, but all of them have been uh, involved in some fashion or another, just with different emphases. The first pillar is that evolution is an invalid science. It is a theory in crisis. And for those of you from the Bay Area will recognize this sign, perhaps. Um, uh, this was uh, visible from the um, uh, entrance to um, this bridge that took us over here to the marina for a while. And when they went out of business, it was too good a picture not to take, right? Um, but uh, that's very common. The second argument that we find quite commonly is that evolution and religion are incompatible. You have to choose between creationism and evolution. And the third argument is that it's only fair. If you're going to teach evolution, be fair. Teach something else to balance it. And um, as I say, the emphases on these uh, three pillars have varied. Over time, uh, right now, we're finding one and three to be the most uh, strongly emphasized, but my colleagues will talk about that a little bit later. Now, I want to talk first about the idea that evolution is invalid science. Um, it is a theory in crisis. You know, scientists are giving up on evolution. <laughs> that may come as a surprise to the scientists in the audience. One technique is to contend that there is an enormous number of scientists that are questioning evolution, but their voices simply are not being allowed to be heard. Our friends at the Discovery Institute, the intelligent design proponents, are very fond of producing lists of scientists from different states who doubt Darwin. These lists have come up in Ohio, Kansas, Texas, Florida, Alabama. We will doubtless see many more of them in the future. Of course, I, I was so delighted to hear Peter's talk this morning for many, many reasons, but also, of course, because he mentioned uh, some of the same points that I wanted to mention, that, you, you know, clearly the number of scientists who agree with an idea is not a measure of whether it's correct or not. We could all be wrong. And similarly, having people who are skeptics of evolution doesn't make them right. What makes one side right or the other side right is whether you've got the evidence to back it up, whether you have tested explanations that have stood the, the test of time that really do help us understand nature. And this is something that um, is not actually the case. Uh, the fact that um, an idea that enters the scientific consensus, like evolution, it gets there because of a hard-won fight. You don't just present an idea that people like and everybody falls in line behind it. The caption on this little cartoon showing the scientist running the <laughs> gauntlet of people with clubs and chainsaws and terrible things. Most scientists regard the new streamlined peer review process as quite an improvement. Uh, if you've ever submitted a paper for a, to a scholarly journal, you understand whereof we speak. Nobody promises you a rose garden. Ideas have to be tested, they have to be reviewed by other scientists, they get batted around for a while, and if the explanation works, if it helps us understand nature, they enter into the consensus, which means they can still be wrong, right? Uh, but if you want to challenge a well-accepted scientific idea, the burden of proof is on you. As Carl Sagan said, second time today at least, maybe more, 
Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But unfortunately, the general public falls rather easily into accepting the idea that if there are scientists on both sides of an issue, then a choice really can't be made. As this school board member from Ohio said, I'm not a PhD in biology, but when I have X number of PhD experts telling me this and X numbers telling me that, the answer is probably somewhere between the two. And the little boy is, has the um, formula 2 plus 2 equals 5, and he's saying, maybe it's not a wrong answer, maybe it's just a different answer. <laughs> no, sometimes it's a wrong answer. <sighs> Lawyers have a somewhat cynical statement about expert witnesses. For every PhD, there is an equal and opposite PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, for every PhD, there is not an equal and opposite PhD. The percentage of scientists supporting creationism or intelligent design is minuscule. In fact, it's arguable that the number is even less than is claimed. But it is very persuasive to the general public that if you have scientist A and scientist B, then the answer must be someplace in between. Now, the most recent versions of the evolution is a theory in crisis argument are from the intelligent design camp, especially these two books, Icons of Evolution and Explore Evolution, which are promoted as being suitable for classroom use to balance the teaching of evolution. Now, of course, a main problem with creationists' attack on evolution is that they really just don't understand the science. So they erect straw men, much as Peter was talking about this morning, which then they triumphantly tear down. And these two books are replete with examples. If you go to uh, ncse.com, you'll find very extensive analyses of both of these books and why the science in these books are just bad. But our beloved of pandas and people is perhaps um, the source of, of our favorite examples at NCSE because they are just so wrong. Um, and I want to give a quick example of an error that continues to be made in intelligent design literature today, even though this book is somewhat old. Now, this illustration appears in of pandas and people, and with this quotation. Amphibians represented in the chart by the bullfrog are traditionally considered closer to fish in the evolutionary scale. Yet, on a molecular level, they are no closer to fish than they are to reptiles or to mammals. To use the classic Darwinian scenario, amphibians are intermediate between fish and other land-dwelling vertebrates. Analysis of their amino acids should place amphibians in an approximately intermediate position, but it does not. And you see here that the genetic distance between carp, cytochrome C, and frogs, reptiles, chickens, uh, mammals is all about 13 units. So this is a real problem for evolution. This is a classic straw man argument. This misstates the evolutionist position. There is not an evolutionary biologist on the planet who thinks that this is a problem for evolutionary biology. This is exactly what you would expect if you understand molecular distances and the whole theory behind them. Where the creationists are coming from, and unfortunately what most of the public semi-understands about evolution, if they understand anything about evolution at all, is not that evolution is this, biological evolution is this branching and splitting uh, tree of life. It's the great chain of being, where simple invertebrates give rise to more complex invertebrates. They give rise to simple vertebrates, which then give rise to more complex vertebrates like amphibians or reptiles or simple mammals, which then give rise to more complicated mammals, and you get all the way up to primates, and of course we know who's at the very top. <laughs> now, um, this is just not the case. Uh, as it happens, amphibians are not closer to fish than they are to mammals, unless your view of evolution is the great chain of being. To review, of pandas and people, version is this. Fish show the same molecular distance from amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. And this is considered a real problem for evolution. Fish are supposed to be closer to amphibians than to other land vertebrates, and they aren't. They're all the same distance. Yet from the standpoint of an evolutionary biologist, the molecular right results are exactly what you should expect. 
The real relationship of these organisms is that all of the land vertebrates are descended from a common four-legged or tetrapod, as they're referred to in, uh, in the jargon of evolutionary biology. And this tetrapod ancestor shared a common ancestor with the ancestor of modern day fish about the same length of time. So of course the molecular distances between fish and all the land vertebrates is the same. It's exactly what you'd expect if you understand evolution. It is not what you expect if your view of evolution is a great chain of being. So for a whole lot of reasons, the creationist idea that evolution is a theory in crisis is just simply wrong. The second pillar is the idea that evolution and religion are incompatible. Now, creationists consider evolution and creation to be stark choices. You're either a good guy creationist Christian or a bad guy evolutionist atheist, or in this diagram, a humanist, which is just as bad. Um, <laughs> Actually, there is a bewildering array of views just among Christians toward evolution. It is very far from a dichotomous choice. Um, a continuum is much more representative of the relationship between creation and evolution. And here is one version of a, cre of a continuum that you can find on ncse.com with creation at the top, evolution at the bottom. Going from the most extreme, creationists are the flat earthers. And I can talk a lot about all of these stages, but we'll just zip on through them. For There really are flat earthers, honest. And, and they really do think that the earth is the, you know, the earth is shaped like a nickel and it's flat. Less extreme, but still out there, are the geocentrists. And yes, there are 21st century geocentrists who believe that the earth is the center of the um, of the solar system. And actually, kind of, what's kind of interesting, and I actually talk about this in the second edition of my book, Plug Plug, that some of the young earth creationists are actually flirting with a little bit of neo-geocentrism, which is very intriguing. Working in, of course, a relativity theory and all sorts of interesting physics and astronomy hand-waving, which um, it's still geocentrism, guys. So. Young Earth creationism uh, is a much more familiar type of creationism to most of us who have con who've been slightly aware of this controversy. Uh, Glenn is going to talk more about Young Earth creationism. There's also Old Earth creationism, and there's a whole continuum within Old Earth creationism, from day-age creationism and gap creationism and progressive creationism and evolutionary creationism and all this other kind of stuff, all dealing uh, to some degree or another with the idea of special creation but accepting the idea that the universe and the planet Earth is millions or even billions of years old. Theistic evolution, uh, the biggest, um, best kept secret in this whole controversy, is that theistic evolution that God creates through evolution is standard Christianity. This is what Catholics believe and mainstream Protestants believe. But because in the United States we have a particularly conservative form of Christianity, we tend to think that uh, biblical literalism is standard Christianity, whereas it simply is not. And at the bottom of the continuum is materialists. Now, this is a, a gross simplification of Christian theology. Uh, the theologians, oh, I forgot to mention intelligent design. Intelligent design is not really new, and it actually straddles a young earth and old earth, and there's a discussion of this on our website if you're interested. But as I say, this is a a real abbreviation of the, of the huge range within Christian theology toward, uh, of views toward evolution. The theologian Ted Peters has produced a whole continuum of ideas just within theistic evolution. So any one of those uh, points on this continuum could be expanded into a continuum all of itself. So the idea that there's somehow this stark choice that you have to choose either evolution or creationism simply is empirically wrong. I was giving a talk a number a couple of years ago um, at a large Midwestern university, and they had just built this wonderful, beautiful new science building. And a big tile on the floor, the thing must have been four feet in diameter, I, I had to really step on my tiptoes in order to take this photograph, included Dobzhansky's, um, the geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky's very famous aphorism starting here, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. A very famous statement. This is in the science building of Notre Dame. Okay? So, dichotomous choice, not so much. The third pillar is fairness. Now, this is in 
virtually any way you can think of, the most successful and the most difficult for us of the pillars of creationism. Because fairness taps very strongly into American cultural traditions. And fairness is a good thing, you know? I want to live in a fair country. I want to live in a country where we have free speech, where people can express their opinions on things. I want to live in a, in a country where we're, we're not just locked into one point of view. I, I, I'm all for fairness. I'm all for these, these concepts that, that my culture, which is your culture, holds very dear. But we should think carefully about how and where we apply the concept of fairness. In general, fairness applies to the ability and the freedom to express and consider different opinions. It's a little quiz, boys and girls. Which of these are opinions? Okay. Do Democrats or Republicans have a better health care plan? Are the Oakland A's a better team than the San Francisco Giants? Does the earth go around the sun or the sun go around the earth? Now, boys and girls, which of these are opinions? Thank you. You passed. But this is, of course, the whole point. In the school districts that debate whether to balance evolution out with creationism or creation science or intelligent design or evidence against evolution, which my colleagues will talk about, what, what they're confusing is a very positive American cultural tradition of fairness and equality and free speech, which applies to opinions. Whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth is not a matter of opinion. It's a, it's a matter of empirical observation, of testing of explanations, of coming up with the best tentative explanation that we have and going with it as long as we can and improving upon it when we possibly may. Evolution happens to be one of those well-tested and very fruitful scientific ideas that explains a lot about the natural world, which is why we feel that it sounds science and why it, it's not an opinion. But evolution is presented, and so is climate change, as Josh will talk about, they are presented as opinions rather than scientifically validated ideas. But fairness is a very popular idea, and it's often expressed in terms of good pedagogy. Uh, a good example of this is um, Stephen Meyer's uh, statement, good pedagogy commends this approach of teaching both sides. Teaching the controversy about Darwinism as it exists in the scientific community will engage student interest. It will motivate students to learn more about the biological evidence as they see why it matters to a big question. All the hot button issues. It's good pedagogy. It engages student interest. It motivates students. These are all, you know, raise your hand if you don't want to motivate students, right? And of course not. You know, we're all in favor of our kids being interested in class, interested in becoming critical thinkers. Who's going to be against that? So we have to be careful the way these arguments are couched and how we respond to them because there are more and less effective ways of responding to some of these uh, issues. Uh, one suggestion that I have for you in dealing with the fairness issue is to point out that there is great agreement among scientists and teachers that evolution is a valid scientific explanation and that therefore it should be taught in the public schools. To pretend to students that scientists are actually contending over whether evolution took place or not is being very unfair to students because you are miseducating them. And there's nothing more unfair to students than handicapping them in terms of their understanding of science so that they can be good decision makers as citizens and certainly handicapping them should they ever desire to have any kind of a career that involves science. Now, we believe that you can't really understand how you got to where you are today without appreciating how you got here, how you got there. And two very good resources for understanding the history of the creation and evolution cycle are Ed Larson's Trial and Error and Ronald Numbered's The Creationists, which is our segue to Glenn Branch, who's going to talk about the history of this controversy and put the um, microphone in his pocket and clip this to his lapel. Go, Glenn. <laughs> Okay. 
So I'm going to take over now to talk about the phases of creationism in the United States. And up here are three of the most recognizable faces of creationism over the years. From left to right, that's William Jennings Bryan, who led the charge in the 1920s to ban the teaching of evolution in the public schools. Henry M. Morris, the father of modern creation science in the 1960s. And uh, Philip Johnson, the main popularizer of intelligent design and teach the controversy in the 1990s. You don't have to be an overweight, balding white man to be a creationist. <laughs> <laughs> so the first wave of anti-evolutionism involves a crusade to ban the teaching of evolution in America's public schools. And this crusade is well underway in the 1920s under the auspices of the boy orator of the Platte. They had better nicknames back then. <laughs> the great commoner, William Jennings Bryan. Bryan, who was nationally famous as a former Secretary of State and a three-time presidential candidate, but more importantly, toward the end of his life, he was a full-time campaigner against evolution. And under Bryan's leadership, anti-evolution laws were introduced in a number of states and passed in five, including in Tennessee in 1925. Uh, the ACLU solicited a teacher to act as a defendant in a test case, and that brought us 1925's State of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes. Now this trial, known to most of us through the somewhat distorted lens of the 1960 film Inherit the Wind, was a pretty rowdy affair, with Brian, acting for the prosecution, even agreeing to take the stand under the cross-examination of Clarence Darrow. That's the scene illustrated here from the 1960 version of Inherit the Wind, with Spencer Tracy as the Darrow character on the left, Frederick Marsh as the uh, Brian character on the right. Now, Scopes was convicted, to nobody's surprise, but his conviction was overturned on appeal, and the state declined to prosecute him again. Yet, in a way, the real winners of the trial were the, really the creationists. And that's because the fuss and controversy over the trial um, discouraged textbook publishers from including evolution in their textbooks. And um, no more anti-evolution laws were passed after the Scopes trial, but they didn't really need to be. Evolution wasn't in the textbooks. In many places, it wasn't being taught. This all changes in the late 1950s when the Soviet Union's launching of the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, convinced the federal government of the United States that the country was lagging in science. How to remedy the situation? By pouring a lot of money into science education to improve the United States' chance in the space race. As a result, Darwin is back with a vengeance as accurate and up-to-date information about evolution starts appearing in the classrooms. Meanwhile, the anti-evolution legislation enacted in the 1920s is being ignored, repealed, the Butler Act was repealed in Tennessee in 1967, and finally challenged in court. Susan Epperson, who you see here on the right, was a high school teacher in Arkansas who was asked by the Arkansas Education Association to be a plaintiff in a case challenging Arkansas's anti-evolution law which, by the way, was the only one enacted by initiative. All the others went through the legislature, but it was actually the people of Arkansas who wanted that bill. The text she's holding there is the text that her school district told her to teach biology out of. Now, this is the descendant of a textbook that had been stripped of human evolution in the wake of the Scopes trial. But the 1965 edition, which Epperson is holding there, reintroduced it. So Epperson is now caught in a bad place. The state law tells her not to teach evolution. Her school district tells her to teach a biology using this book, which has evolution in it. So Epperson went to court asserting that the statute uh, violated her constitutional rights. The case wound its way to the Supreme Court, which made short work of it, and ruled that bans on teaching evolution for religious reasons violated the First Amendment of the Constitution. Creationists are a resilient lot. And this brings us to the second phase of anti-evolution activity in the United States, um, in which it being no longer possible to rely on statutory bans on evolution, it's necessary for creationists to seek some equal time in the science classrooms of the public schools for their view. And something called creation science was developed largely at the hands of Henry M. Morris of the Institute for Creation Research, who died in 2006. Okay, so what is creation science? 
Creation science is a package of doc doctrines based on a particular narrow reading of Genesis, um, sometimes called Young Earth Creationism, for which scientific support is claimed. That's why it's creation science, or sometimes scientific creationism. It must be science. It's right there in the name, after all. <laughs> so th these doctrines hold that the universe and the Earth are about 6,000, maybe at a stretch about 10,000 years old, that living things were specially created by God to reproduce after their own kind, meaning in particular that evolution across kinds is impossible, and that Noah's flood was a historic worldwide event responsible for most of the fossil record and for geological features like the Grand Canyon. Young Earth creationism is a fairly young phenomenon, if you'll excuse the expression. Uh, although there are anticipations of it, it doesn't become really popular until the 1960s to the point that today, despite the presence of other forms of creationism, young earth creationism is still the dominant form of creationism in the United States today. There are lots of organizations espousing it, including the Institute for Creation Research, the Creation Research Society, which is the scholarly arm of the movement, and uh, Answers in Genesis, which is perhaps less scholarly but makes up for it in marketing savvy. These are the people who opened a $27 million creation museum in northern Kentucky and have plans on um, now on opening an ark park with a, with a scale model of Noah's Ark. So to illustrate the sorts of claims that creation science makes, take the Grand Canyon, which, as any geologist will tell you, began to be eroded about four million years ago, exposing strata that reveal a 1.75 billion year span of the Earth's history. Well, I say any geologist, but a young Earth creationist geologist will look at those strata and meticulously identify them as originating before the flood, in creation week, that is, early on in the flood, late in the flood, or, of course, after the flood. <laughs> if you want to know more about why Grand Canyon was not, as the creationists claim, rapidly cut through catastrophically deposited layers of sediment, this is a paid advertisement, consider coming on NCSC's Grand Canyon trip this summer. Here we are looking at a uh, sandstone slab that young earthers claim shows the tracks of reptiles escaping from the rising floodwaters. <laughs> of course, you have to ask, how do you get a wind lane sandstone layer in between two water lane sedimentary deposits while a global flood is going on? Uh, so this is a unique chance to take a two-model raft trip uh, where we present the evolutionist view and perhaps not entirely seriously the creationist view and let you make up your own mind. <laughs> well, we're not too serious on this trip about the two-model approach, but the creation science activists of the 60s and 70s certainly were. Oh, for some familiar faces. Uh, after the Scopes era bans on teaching evolution were ascended or overturned, legislation calling for equal time for creation science was introduced in no fewer than 27 states, successfully in both Arkansas and Louisiana in 1981. Now, the Arkansas trial was ruled unconstitutional in a landmark trial called McLean versus Arkansas in 1982, in which the creationists were routed by a stellar legal team for the plaintiffs, including uh, expert witnesses such as Francisco Ayala, Brent Dalrymple, and our beloved Stephen Jay Gould. And there you have it. The judge struck down the Arkansas creationism law. This was such a defeat, resounding defeat for the creationists that the decision was not appealed from the federal district court. The Louisiana bill, however, eventually reached the Supreme Court, which in 1987 ruled, in a case called Edwards v. Aguilard, that teaching creationism in the public schools violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. The act, the court said, impermissibly endorses religion by advancing the religious belief that a supernatural being created humankind. So far, so good. But there were passages in the court's opinion and in a dissent that may indeed have encouraged creationists to regroup in the wake of Edwards v. Aguilard. One of these occurs in the court's opinion authored by Justice Brennan. So the court's opinion conceded that teaching a variety of scientific theories about the origins of humankind to school children might be validly done. Now, 
by rebranding the creation stories of Genesis as scientific creationism or creation science, creationists had al already gone some way to try to present their views as scientific. But would it be possible to repackage creationism even in even more secular appearing forms so that it could survive constitutional scrutiny? Second, the dissent authored by Justice Scalia argued that Louisiana was quite entitled as a secular matter to have whatever scientific evidence there may be against evolution presented in their schools. Was that a hint that creationists, creationists should shut up about creationism, at least as far as science education in the public schools is concerned, and should instead sling mud at evolution in the hope that students would acquire or retain uh, faith in creationism? That's certainly how the Institute for Creation Research took it, saying in the wake of the Edwards decision that school boards and teachers should be strongly encouraged at least to stress the scientific evidences and arguments against evolution in their classes, even if they don't wish to recognize those as evidences and arguments for creation. Emphasis very much in original. Notice that this approach relies on what the decision in the McLean case called a contrived dualism. The idea that evolution and creationism are not only contradictory but also exhaustive, so that any evidence or arguments against evolution must therefore ipso facto constitute evidence for creationism, and in fact for a very particular kind of creationism. Whether it's directly inspired by these remarks or not, the third phase of anti-evolutionism was dominated by these two tactics in the form of intelligent design and teach the controversy and allied slogans. And a major figure in popularizing, though not inventing both, was Philip Johnson, a professor of law at Bolt Hall, the law school at the University of California in Berkeley, a stone's throw from where we are right now. So I'm going to say a bit about intelligent design and when my colleague Josh Rosen now picks up, he'll be saying more about the other. So, at bottom, as you can tell from this potted legal history, intelligent design is really, at bottom, about finding something that can be billed as a scientific alternative to evolution that will survive constitutional scrutiny. Consequently, proponents of intelligent design insist that their view does not uh, entail any particular conception of the designer. It could be God, they acknowledge, <laughs> but it could be aliens from outer space, or perhaps time-traveling scientists from the far future. I am not making this up. <laughs> For similar reasons, intelligent design strives to maintain a big tent under which anti-evolutionists of all stripes are welcome to uh, shelter, including young Earth creationists, old Earth creationists, uh, Hare Krishna creationists, Orthodox Jewish creationists, Islamic creationists, Native American creationists, practically the only creationists who have not been welcomed in the big tent are the uh, alien-obsessed, cloning, false, falsifying, free-love, alien cult, the Ray Aliens, whose endorsement of teaching intelligent design in the public schools of the United States was met with a stony silence. <laughs> so individual proponents of intelligent design will have their own views, of course, on the nature of the designer, the age of the earth, common ancestry, Noah's flood, and all the rest, but the official theory is supposed to be neutral on all of these. So intelligent design boils down to the assertion that somewhere, at some point in time, someone did something, somehow, for some reason, that affected the history of life. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, if you encourage teachers to present this as scientifically credible, students in public schools are going to have their own ideas about how to fill in all those blanks, and the result is going to be students continuing to believe or coming to believe in creationism, and most likely young earth creationism. This role of intelligent design was not lost on a school board in Dover, Pennsylvania. Now, there are over 15,000 local school boards in the country, and I'm showing the boundaries of the ones in a chunk of the northeast here, which is why you see all these tiny little fussy lines. So, here's Dover. In Dover, in 2004, 
The school board's attempts to get equal time for creationism mutated eventually into a policy that students will be made aware of gaps slash problems in Darwin's theory and of other theories of evolution, including but not limited to intelligent design. And a disclaimer that implemented this policy explicitly referred students to of pandas and people, that intelligent design textbook we've already met, for information about intelligent design. No surprise then that 11 local parents filed suit, represented by the ACLU of Pennsylvania, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, a Philadelphia law firm called Pepper Hamilton. And NCSC was also involved in this. We helped assemble the legal team. We uh, furnished the expert witnesses, and we even had a staff member working uh, pretty much overtime for more than a year to give scientific and other kinds of assistance to the legal team. Now, one of the interesting things that was revealed during this um, trial, as uh, our opening video showed, was that Of Pandas and People was revealed to be a creationist uh, textbook originally. And here's a bit of evidence that we didn't use at trial, supposedly because we thought there was no point in flogging a dead horse. So Barbara Forrest, one of the expert witnesses for the plaintiffs, discovered a passage in a draft of a pandas and people that reads, evolutionists think the former is correct, creationists accept the latter view. The corresponding passage in the published version of the book reads, evolutionists think the former is correct, and design proponents accept the latter view. Forrest managed to locate a perfect transitional form in an intermediate draft. <laughs> evolutionists think the former is correct, see design proponentists except the latter view. This has been dubbed the uh, copy and paste error from hell. <laughs> so in the Kitzmiller case, the decision was a complete vindication of the plaintiffs. As you see here, the judge rules intelligent design is, I can't quite make that, <laughs> not science. So did that mean intelligent design was through? Well, not by a long shot, even though, as you see here, it's not making a lot of progress. <laughs> the Kitzmiller decision was precedent only in the middle federal district of Pennsylvania, and it was not appealed to a higher court. It's a stunningly well-wrought decision, though, and like the decision in McLean versus Arkansas before it, it's sure to have a great influence on any future cases. But perhaps because intelligent design is now generally seen as a losing strategy for the creationists, what we've seen is an intensification of this fallback strategy that the Institute for Creation Research recommended in 1987 after the Edwards decision of spreading confusion about evolution under rubrics like Teach the Controversy. A few years before Kitzmiller, even the Discovery Institute, the de facto institutional headquarters of intelligent design, had signaled its intention of doing so. And it's very easy to foment the impression that there is a scientific controversy about evolution. Here you see a report from a uh, debate between a creationist and a scientist. The scientist admits, appropriately, there certainly is debate within the scientific community about the details of evolution, but aha! You're admitting that evolution is bogus. The scientific community disputes the theory of evolution. You folks heard an evolution is a fraud. Good night, folks. You've been a lovely audience. And that's how those debates often go, of course. Moreover, it, we're still seeing teachers or administrators or people in the community who want creation science to be taught. Never mind intelligent design, they want creation science to be taught, even though we've had the Supreme Court decision on the book for years. And it's easy for attacks on evolution education, whether they take the form of creation science, intelligent design, teach the controversy, what have you, it's easy for them to continue due to the radical decentralization of American education with 15,000 school districts that are making their own decisions about curriculum and instruction. Nobody can possibly keep their eye on every school district. In many U.S. classes, we know evolution takes a back seat, as the New York Times reminded us in 2005. Origins of species? In many schools, the dog ate that chapter. <laughs> Anecdotes and impressions are rife. But the first really good study, a rigorous national study of public high school biology teachers was conducted in 2006 by uh, Michael Berkman and Eric Plutzer and their colleagues. 
They found 13% of high school biology teachers in the public schools are presenting creationism as scientifically credible. That's a shade over one in eight. 2%, not that many, but still 2% more than you would wish, are omitting evolution altogether. 17% are omitting human evolution altogether. That's one in six. And 60%, the majority, six out of 10, are failing to present evolution forthrightly, by which Berkman and Putzer mean in the ways that the nation's leading scientific uh, establishments would have them do so. And Berkman and Putzer recently wrote, the cautious 60% may play a far more important role in hindering scientific literacy in the United States than the smaller number of explicit creationists. And they're talking about teachers here. At that point, I was supposed to have some kind of segue to bring it over to Josh. <laughs> well, and here he is. All right, so the, the slide here that you can see is, uh, the picture is the, the cliffs of Dover in England, not actually in Dover, Pennsylvania. But whenever I think about what happened in Dover, somehow the image of cliffs and things going off them comes to mind. So, um, after Dover, the Discovery Institute published a, uh, a, a pamphlet describing their, their responses to that court case and to the, the judge's ruling there, where they, they argued that as a consequence of the ruling, administrative guidelines, even legislative enactments, are needed to provide clearer protection for the rights of students and teachers to critically analyze Darwin's theory in the classroom. This language about critical analysis became, uh, got picked up and used widely uh, State standards in, in Ohio had already been trying to introduce that as a, a euphemism for creationism. But they started pushing this harder, as it says, in, in laws and in administrative guidelines, uh, along with several other related euphemisms, including things like uh, critically, in addition to critically analyzed, they had talking about the strengths and weaknesses, the evidence for and against, uh, theory, not fact, which is a staple going back to William Jennings Bryan the idea of teaching the controversy, all being euphemisms for teaching non-science in the name of fairness, the third pillar that Jeannie was talking about. And one of the most pervasive of these euphemisms in recent years has been this idea of uh, using the, the claim of academic freedom as an argument for, uh, for undermining the teaching of evolution. And in the last seven years now, we've been tra tracing a series of laws that try to really radically redefine what academic freedom means for secondary school teachers, uh, starting out with a series of laws that were introduced in Alabama and that have then mutated and evolved over the years, uh, one version being adopted by the Discovery Institute as model legislation that they've been promoting to state legislators since 2008. And this particular tree of, of these, uh, the family tree, talks about presenting students with the full range of views on scientific controversies, on granting students and teachers rights to espouse on their own or in their classrooms or in their coursework uh, alternative theories, and to not be able to, to punish them or otherwise uh, interfere with students or teachers who happen to hold these alternative views. Uh, and later on, adding this disclaimer that you know, whatever anyone might think, these laws should not be construed to be promoting religion. Similar uh, disclaimers were in the McLean era laws in Arkansas and in Louisiana. The courts didn't have to pay them much mind there. Whether they would in this case is uh, yet to be tested. Another strain of these laws starts out with a series of a sort of weird mishmash of laws and state science standards and other things, local district policies in Ohio and California, Montana, Wisconsin, etc., which got pulled together into a, a local policy in Washita Parish, Louisiana, a policy which urged uh, on critical analysis of controversial topics, listing not just evolution, but also global warming, human cloning, etc., set of topics that is united by nothing so much as the fact that conservatives tend not to like them. Uh, and again, this is not requiring any teacher to do anything that they weren't already doing. It simply permits them to, uh, to go beyond the established curriculum in ways that they, they deem fit. 
the, the merging of these two lineages of, of laws has produced another whole branch, including a law that actually was enacted in Louisiana. These other bills were introduced uh, over the years, 39 of them since 2004, in 13 states. Uh, this year alone, nine have been filed. Fortunately, none uh, appear likely to, to pass. Most of them died in committee or, or at the end of legislative session. So just to talk briefly about the Louisiana law, uh, as I said, it, here you can see it talking about um, helping students understand, analyze, critique, and review scientific theories using, as it says, supplemental textbooks after teachers have used the, the standard approved textbook. It, it has this disclaimer that I mentioned about, you know, please don't construe this to be religious. Please, you know, believe me when I tell you that this passes the First Amendment. <laughs> and it, uh, it introduces this idea of not just attacking evolution, which several courts had looked at, at other policies that did that and said, well, it may be unconstitutional simply by virtue of singling out evolution. That may be evidence of an unconstitutional intent. So they throw in global warming, they throw in human cloning, these other things that are uh, politically contentious, but again, not scientifically contentious, as we heard this morning. This is not the only instance where we see this, con this uh, combination of evolution and global warming. A uh, little over a year ago, the New York Times ran a front page story talking about how Darwin's foes have added global warming to their target list. With a state legislator in Kentucky, where one of these academic freedom bills was being considered at the time, saying, our kids are being presented theories as though they are facts, not distinguishing which of the, the particular theories he was taking issue with there. And they also have an approving quote from someone at the Discovery Institute whose own model legislation doesn't make that combination, but who has no objection to it happening anyway. And in surveying these, the various incidents of, of this combination, that we've seen a, a similarity between the pillars of creationism that Jeannie was talking about and what we can think of as pillars of uh, global warming denial. Uh, you've seen this all already. We tend to steal from each other's slides at NCSE, so this may look familiar. <laughs> Uh, but in climate change denial, instead of talking about evolution being weak science, you have global warming being weak science. In this case, because a global, you know, it's snowing in the winter, therefore global warming must not be true. <laughs> the idea that climate change is, it's instead of anti-religious, it's anti-capitalist. It's a different sort of ideology that's being defended, but it's still an ideological defense. Uh, and that it's unfair to impose in a classroom or through government policies or international treaties to impose these policies until everyone agrees that global warming is really happening. Uh, and we can see this play out actually in one of the responses to that New York Times article. This is from the American Enterprise Institute's uh, House Journal where one of their policy analysts who, who works on, who's one of the, the uh, prominent global warming deniers trots out all three of these uh, pillars. So you have him saying that the science of climate change is weak. The temperature data are missing, computer programs are filling in the missing data, the, or things are not being adjusted for properly, all the sorts of things that Peter Gleick was talking about this morning. You have him talking about the draconian climate policies that are regressive, authoritarian, anti-capitalist, and impoverishing their effects enabling those who would use government to force our society what most would find a communitarian dystopia. <laughs> Therefore, the science should be ignored. And that uh, it should be, it's a matter of choice. All of this is a matter of choice. Count how many times he uses the word choice in this one sentence alone. People having the house of their choice, the car of their choice, the light bulb, and so on. So, um, so he, w the article's point actually was that Creationists ought not to get involved in this because this was far too important an issue to, to muck around with the, the obviously failed science of uh, creationism or pseudoscience of creationism. On the other hand, you had folks at the Discovery Institute jumping on this. This is Stephen Meyer, a vice president at the Discovery Institute, saying, yes, all of these, uh, these stolen emails from a university in, in England just prove everything that they've been saying about evolution all this time. It's the same... Uh, way that Darwin doubting scientists down at the bottom have complained of precisely the same abuses that were being claimed about, uh, to, that these emails showed. There have been nine or ten now independent analyses of these emails by courts, by legislatures, by academic bodies, 
all of them finding no evidence of any sort of wrongdoing whatsoever, making this yet another case of at least the first pillar. Here you have the train of global warming about to run someone over while someone shouts, look at these scandalous emails. There are some of the climate change deniers who have, have jumped on uh, the, who, who do straddle this line. You've got Roy Spencer, who's uh, University of Alabama clim uh, climate scientist who has done a lot of work uh, fighting the, the consensus on climate change, and who has also written in, uh, one of, in his regular outlet about his support for intelligent design creationism. On the other hand, you have perhaps the, the be best credentialed of the climate change deniers, Richard Linson, an MIT uh, meteorologist, who here you see talking about the IPCC consensus on climate science and arguing that it makes arguments in support of intelligent design sound rigorous by comparison. It constitutes a rejection of scientific logic while widely put forward as being demanded by science. So clearly this is not a, a perfect correlation between these two ideas, but um, a lot of the, the rhetoric certainly that we've seen in the evolution realm shows up in the climate change realm. Here you have a resolution that was passed by the South Dakota Senate last year. It's a non-binding resolution, I should say, but it passed overwhelmingly. This is an early draft. They later took out some of the funnier lines in here, but that's why I use this one. So, and we can look at how the pillars play out in this instance, too. You have the idea that we need a balanced teaching of global warming. This is the classic third pillar rhetoric that, that we saw through, through the history of creationism. The idea that there's no evidence for global warming. First pillar, science is weak. The idea that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, but is in fact a highly beneficial ingredient for all plant life on the earth. So therefore, yeah. The idea that global warming is a scientific theory rather than a fact. Again, standard rhetoric going back to William Jennings Bryan. The idea that climatological, meteorological, astrological, thermological, cosmological, and ecological dynamics could explain the difference between, uh, could explain why the Earth is, is changing its climate. Whether the dis d discovery of this uh, 13th astrological sign changes any of the science, I don't know. <laughs> and then finally concluding, the debate on global warming has subsumed political and philosophical viewpoints and therefore is not appropriate for the classroom. So, cla I mean, it's basically, it's almost like they did a search and replace on a creationist tract and came up with this. Similarly, you have local folks. This is a, a news story about a local school district in Colorado where a group of people got a petition together demanding that global warming be removed from the classrooms, saying that global warming is junk science, that it is un t teaching it is unnecessarily scaring school children, and therefore it should be taken out of the classrooms because we need balanced education. It's not a proven scientific theory. The idea that it was not just some liberal theory was scoffed and, and sh people shook their heads at this idea that it wasn't a liberal theory. And finally, the, the uh, advocate of the petition said that um, if the subject is going to be taught, the other side should be presented so that students are not subjected to a frightening untruth. And a lot of teachers who, who face this sort of pressure are responding to it. There's a survey that was done in Colorado that shows similar sorts of uh, responses to this pressure that we see around evolution. Here, teach, a group of teachers were asked whether, how they would react to, um, to pressure from students to teach both sides. And about uh, seven-eighths of the teachers said that they would, they would be in favor of teaching both sides in the classroom in, rea in response to their students' concerns. When asked about the particular strategies that they use, a lot of them, between three quarters and two thirds of the teachers, did say that they would follow the strategy that we tend at NCSE to advocate, which is talk about the nature of science, explain you know, what's a scientific theory and why is, why is creationism, why is global warming denial, why are these not legitimate scientific theories anymore, at least. Uh, and, but almost equal numbers say that they allow, acknowledge and or allow discussion of ideas expressed by global warming skeptics in their classroom in response to this pressure. Um, as well as, it should be said, a variety of other strategies that were far less common, but that, that still do occur on the, in the creationism and evolution conflict as well. Um, 
in addition, we have local state standards, as, as here in Texas, which require that textbooks and that teachers in the classroom and that any tests that are provided, standardized tests, cover the evidence for and against the existence of global warming. Again, this is something that the IPCC looked at in 2007 and said that the evidence for this was unequivocal. I don't know how they're going to write those textbooks. It may be that they will draw on the sorts of supplements that groups like here, the American Coal Foundation produces uh, in resources like power from coal, which explains along the way that some scientists believe adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere will make the Earth's climate become warmer. Other scientists do not believe this is likely or have said the climate is made of many complex factors we don't fully understand. More time is needed for researchers to gather information on these questions. Or you have videos distributed here by a group called Is It, which uh, follows the same sort of three-pillar strategy here, so talking about the, the weaknesses of the science, saying, well, maybe global warming that we've observed in the temperature record is just caused by variations in solar levels. And arguing that shouldn't this critical question remain open to scientific inquiry? Classic third pillar sort of euphemistic language. In the video itself, they have a transcript where they quote Dr. Willie Soon, one of the prominent climate change deniers, having a, that nagging question in us. Yes, we've emitted all this carbon dioxide. Are we really, really melting all the ice caps? Or is it something even more powerful than that? I mean, could it even be the sun that's actually doing it? <laughs> and here you see at the, at the bottom of the, the top image, you have teacher reviews, one of which says, uh, this video provided an excellent opposing view for an inconvenient truth. I used it to set up a debate with my honors class. This is not the pedagogy that we would recommend at NCFC, I should say. Uh, and if you look for the, the, third, the, the second pillar, which wasn't really explicit on that first page, you go to the About Us section on, on isit.org, and all of the discussion here is about you know, preparing students for successful self-government to uh, gain greater appreciation for how a free society with a strong rule of law enables a diverse people to coexist, cooperate, and prosper. And so on and so forth in this vein. It also says at the bottom there, isit.org is an educational initiative of the Free to Choose Network, which is part of, along with uh, Winning Ideas Weekend, Free to Choose.tv, and there at the end, the Free to Choose Milton Friedman section, <laughs> is dedicated in general to using their media to promote, to provide, build popular support for personal, economic, and political freedom. We believe these freedoms are interdependent and must be sustained by the rule of law, Frederick Hayek, so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, classic second pillar sorts of things. This is about, the agenda here is not scientific, it's political, it's for a particular ideological angle. And so I'll, I'll just wind up with an idea that, that Glenn and Jeannie both mentioned, that kids born today, no matter, even if we stopped, shut down every coal plant, did everything, stopped emitting carbon dioxide, global warming would not stop instantly. Global warming in some form would continue for the lifetime of every kid in high school today. This is something that they need to understand accurately. We're living in the age also of personal genomics. We're living in a time when you can get your, within the lifetime of kids in school today, they're gonna be able to have their whole genome sequence, they're gonna be able to compare it to other species and see how the genes and the particular forms of the genes that they have impact their health and the health of other similar organisms. They need to understand evolution, to understand the new discoveries that are going to be made in their lifetimes, to be not just informed doctors, but to be informed patients, to be informed citizens, and of course to be economically competitive, as this cartoon nicely illustrates. <laughs> and so that's why we do what we do at NCSE. We're on the web, we're on Twitter, we're every place. And thank you all.